So we want to start basically with the first set of uh, machine learning techniques after we got some preparation. And it's natural to start with clustering because uh, historically they were among the first smart techniques that were introduced. So we will start with clustering. And the idea of clustering is that intelligence is the capability of grouping similar objects. So the thesis or the idea is straightforward. If you can group similar objects, you must have certain level of intelligence. So um, if you know different type of squares and rectangles and different sizes of uh, circles and flowers and cars, and you can group them uh, in a game together, so that means you, 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 you have certain level of smartness about it. So basically, clustering groups unlabeled data into clusters of similar inputs, of similar inputs. And from the perspective of learning that we want to start talking about that. So the, the adjective unlabeled is extremely important because that means we are dealing, in terms of uh, any clustering technique, we are dealing with unsupervised learning. So unlabeled means unsupervised. And at the moment, there are, there are critical voices that as long as we are relying on supervised learning, um, we will stick with weak AI because uh, the actual strong AI or artificial general intelligence has to be unsupervised. So from that perspective is another reason for me to start with clustering because, and they, they are being somewhat, somewhat uh, neglected, let's say. So if we look at, I have mentioned verbally the example of cars. So if I have horsepower of cars and I have the maximum speed of cars as features and I want to classify cars, I may get something like this. I may get some cars here. I may get some cars here. And I may get some cars here. So there are cars that have a lot of horsepower, but their maximum speed is not very high. There are cars that don't have a lot of horsepower, but more or less have the same maximum speed, a little bit higher. And there are cars that don't have that much of horsepower, but they are really fast. Well, if you, if you give them to any, so if you remember, we implied that uh, AI is a function approximation and mostly we worked with separating stuff, but clustering basically goes and finds groups of objects that are very similar. And this could be done labeled trucks. This could be labeled sport cars. And this could be la labeled SUVs. So of course, no technique can tell you this is a sport car, this is a truck. They will just say, this is group one. You can put the label on it and say group one is SUVs. It doesn't matter what label comes. When we talk about label, we mean label in terms of you only get X. And con in contrast to or versus supervised, which you get X, and the desired output. 
So we don't we don't start with the with the supervised way. And so basically, you give every point is represented in this simplified example with two features: horsepower and maximum speed. And then some clustering algorithm comes and groups the points together and says, this is one group, this is one group, this is one group. I don't know what they, their names are. I, don't, I have no idea, but they belong to, to each other. So that, that's a, that's a uh, certain level of intelligence. Uh, of course, when we do that, we can ask whether our, our, our clusters well separated. Separated. So I, I, in, this, in this kindergarten example, you see that the SUVs and sport cars and trucks are nicely separated. There is an ocean of distance between them. So I can give this to most stupid algorithm. They should be able to do this. This is an easy problem. So they are well separated, which means, as we say, I, I'm not drawing lines because you're not doing classification. There is no line here. Grouping, clustering, is different from classification. Classification is supervised. Clustering is unsupervised. Then, or more importantly, are clusters linearly separable? Although I'm not drawing any lines here, but can I, if, if I would, if I would, would I be able to separate these groups with drawing some lines? So if I draw a line here, draw a line here, well, I would, I would separate them. So this is a linearly separable problem, which has nothing to do whether you want to classify data or you want to cluster the data, nothing to do with that. Linear separability says how difficult it is to recognize stuff. So linear separability is easy. If they are not linearly separable, that's difficult. <clears throat> so example would be, so if I have something like this, and now I have to draw something that doesn't make sense to you. So you see, you see a chunk of a chunk of data, and there is no separation. So here, visually, you could say this is this, this is this. There is no way I can draw lines. So if I group this with clustering, so I get my three classes this way. They are not linearly separable. This was linearly separable, although I am not separating them by drawing a line. This is not classification. But still, whether the data is easy or difficult will affect me. Doesn't matter what I want to do with the data. <clears throat> and so difficulties could be uh, overlaps, that clusters or group have overlap with each other. So they go inside each other territory. And you may get complicated shapes. So the shape of the clusters may not be just, I don't know, almost circular, easy. It, it may get a weird shape to draw a boundary line or contour around each group. <clears throat> so clustering algorithms, can be divided basically in two types with respect to what they expect from us. One is uh, they need to know the number of clusters. Who told me that I have to look for three clusters here, trucks, SUVs, and sport cars? I, I, I knew it. So I told the algorithm, look for three clusters. So what would happen if I asked the, cluster, the, the clustering algorithm to look for four clusters, five clusters? It will find something. 
which most likely it will not be meaningful. So there are techniques that you have to tell them what k is, what, what is the number of clusters. And there are some that don't need it. So they will figure it out. They will figure out how many clusters there are. They will go inside. They will just jump into the pool and say, OK, let's figure it out. Of course, that's a very desirable attribute of a clustering technique. If, if uh, I don't need to tell the algorithm, look for three groups of cars, three clusters of cars. It can become very, very fast, very, very complicated because uh, most of the time we don't work with two features. <laughs> most of the time we work with several hundred features. And most of the time we have no clue how many different patterns are in the data. So, and then we may start, how do we do that if the technique needs to know how many clusters to extract? Well, there are ways to do it. There is, there is, there is, a, there is a trick for everything, for every problem. So, we start with k-means, with k-means algorithm. which is, by definition, um, what k-means was invented in the early 70s. It was based on some previous observations. And then since then, many, many uh, versions of k-means have been introduced, but the core has stayed the same, and the core is really simple. So the main idea of k-means is find the centroids which are basically the prototypes, prototypes, or, or means, averages, of k clusters. So k means basically means how many means do you have, how many averages of the class you have. And so this is a mean. This is a mean. This is a mean. So I have three means here. So k means means how many clusters do you have? I will go and try to find the prototype for each one of them. And the prototype happens to be the average of the class. And when I say average of the class, that means clustering techniques like this have to be applied on, on numbers. Cannot apply them on, on categorical data unless you somehow uh, come up with some quantification for them. <clears throat> so how it works is actually quite, quite simple. So what we do is first we randomly, we randomly place k centroids. So if somebody has told you find three clusters here, that means you have three centroids. If you, if you come up with three random numbers, you cannot really call them centroids, but I pull them and the second iteration they become centroids. So when I place them, they are not centroids. They are just three random numbers. So if this goes from 1 to 100 and this goes from 1 to 1,000, whatever, so just Get, get some random numbers in that range. So, and your initial one could be here, 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 it doesn't matter. So you start with three random numbers, which may be completely outside of your data. Why do we do that? Because we have no idea. We don't know where to start. We have to start somewhere. And we will do that when we get to neural networks. We don't know where to start because the, the solution space is very difficult. So we start with random guesses. With the entire network is uh, uh, configured with random, random weights. So you randomly place k centroids, and then second step, we assign, we assign each data point to its closest 
cluster k. So if I come up with, with random guesses, so each one of them has some distance from every data point, then I start and say, okay, you know what, this and this guy are close to this. So I assign these two guys to this. And these two guys are very close to this. So I will assign these two data points to this. At the beginning, it doesn't make sense, of course. But we have to be patient. So after we go through the iterations, hopefully things start to take shape. And then there will be no learning if I make some random guesses and stay there. So I have to move. I have to move. So I have to move means this guy across some sort of trajectory has to come here. This guy has a much longer trajectory, has to come here. And this guy has to somehow get here. If I manage to do that, I have learned the groups and clusters of the cars with respect to those two features. So that's the learning part. The trajectory of these three numbers in this case to start here and get to the actual mean of every cluster, meaningful cluster. That's the learning part. So, so, of course, then you have to update the centroids. What I just indicated. So this is updating. So in every iteration, it takes many, many iterations in every iteration. So I'm here, and then 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 here. So it may take several thousand iterations. To get there, yes. Which which data point? There is all over the place. I see this. Right. Mean of what? Sorry. Mean of what? All Some people do that. all of them. I get one mean. Yeah, but then that's a better. Isn't that a better guess than? Yeah, we are not sure. Point. You what you could do is you could gr randomly grab some of them. Divide it in three randomly and make that as, as your average. You can do that, yes. But we don't see this structure when we start. The algorithm doesn't see it. We don't know where the means are. So, and again, so I, I did not draw this as a circle and this as a square and this as a, a triangle to say that they are different things because the, the software does not see any difference. They are all just numbers. So the structure is not visible. But going back to his point, there are many different ways to start. Just starting with randomness is, is the most obvious way, is a cheap way, is a safe way in most cases. But there are other ways. So there are, there are no rules that you should not try to start in a, in a, in a different way. You can. <clears throat> so. Which means, so we have basically two types of adjustment. So if I have, let's say, three points here, three points here, and I get two, so I'm, I'm looking for two uh, clusters. So I have to calculate the distance of this guy to 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 this guy. So I have to calculate the distance of the first candidate centroid, which is not a centroid yet, to all data points. And then the second one, the distance to this one, 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 to this one. So I calculate the distance of the all centroids to all. So these are distances for class assignment. For class assignment. Because I want to know that, for example, uh, if this is 1 and this is 2, if this is C1 and this is C2, my centroids, I want to know that when I start, this 2 belong to this guy and this 4 belong to this guy. But of course, when I start moving, for example, when this one gets close to here, maybe this one belongs to this one. So things will move. People Data points will, will change membership to different clusters all the time. And if you visualize it, you see 
as if it's a competition that this guy jumps from this group to that group, this guy jumps from this group to that group, because it's still not clear who is the prototype, the representative of each cluster. For that, you need to converge. So if you converge to the real averages of clusters, then it's clear, then we stop. But we do also something else. Then, so when I, when I, again, if I try to redraw this, and again, I have my center, then, in, in, then you have another type of distance calculation that you only calculate distance inside a class. So these are distance calculation for updates. Well, basically for error. So at any moment I know that for any, at any moment I assume this center rates are okay. This, this is the best I got. So I calculate the distance of every data point from every position of my centroids, and somehow I add them. And if they are good centroids, what? The sum of distance should be minimal, isn't it? If it is really in center, so look at this guy. This is very, very close to this guy, to this guy, to this guy. The distance could be really small. So, and everything else is, is close compared to these ones. So if this is a really good centroid, and the sum of distances to the elements inside the class is a temporary class. I know it's a temporary class until I converge. But the sum of distances to every centroid should be minimal if it is a good centroid. So if, do, if I do one more step and the distance becomes m even less, oh, I have not found the optimal class centroids, yes. So go further. And then I move, I move, I move, I move, I move. And I see that the error is going down. The error is what? The sum of all distances. Clearly here, if I look at this guy, so this average could be easily here. And then I have my best centroid. As long as I'm not here, I have to move. I have to move, ideally in a straight line, because I don't want to waste time. I want to just go the fastest way toward a centroid. So a trajectory like this is not good, because I'm going some detour, which means it takes a lot of time to get there. So I don't want to do that. And we will see that whatever we do, we want to get there fast, because computations are, computations are um, expensive. OK. Good. There's, there's, there is not much into k-means, but we still have to mention some attributes, and then we move on. And we look at another version of k-means. So the similarity grouping here, the similarity grouping, so you group data points based on similarity. Uh, happens happens via distance measurement. Distance measurement. Measurement. Well, surprise, surprise. We don't have anything else. Similarity, dissimilarity, cl proximity, closeness, whatever, distance. You have to calculate distance. Didn't we do that for PCA2? Wasn't that about subject of Tisney? Yeah, of course. So we don't have any other tool. Everybody cooks with water. If you cook with oil, you're going to die of high cholesterol. So <laughs> there is only one liquid. <clears throat> now, if I have a point xi, I have another point xj, and I'm looking at ck, and ck is the cluster, is the k's cluster centroid, then we are talking about distance between i and j. 
So you want to calculate that distance, which of course we calculate via taking xi1 minus xj1 squared plus xi2 minus xj2 squared and so on, which is the Euclidean di distance of xi minus xj, the good old Euclidean distance to calculate the distance. So if the distance is small, you are similar to me. If the distance is large, you are not similar to me. You should not be in the same cluster as I do. So we trust the distance metrics a lot. They measure everything. So that's the driving force. Yes? So x is, x is a vector of features. It has many features. So horsepower, color, maximum speed, insurance premium, and the, that, um, so one, two, three, four, and this i is the measurement, and one, two, three, four are the features. Measurements. This is the Euclidean distance. This is the L2 norm, which is the same thing as we know from the high school. We know it from high school, don't we? Which high school? <laughs> so, <laughs> So what is the objective? Well, the objective is fundamentally the error. And the error for us is you sum everything over the k clusters. So if I do capital K here. So you have to go over all clusters. I'm talking about here. This is distance calculation. So you sum everything over all classes. And then you sum over all those x's that belong to a certain cluster CK. Now I'm talking here. So I do this, and then I do this, and then I sum it up. And that is the distance. The distances should be small. So the number, the sum of distances, I'm looking at it as error. Technically, it's not error. But you are not similar to me, so it's an error. So the sum of distances across all clusters and all instances is my error, which will drive the learning, which is the Euclidean distance of x minus mk, and m being the centroid of the kth cluster. So centroid, centroid of the case cluster. So that's basically it. So we have to minimize this because we want to be similar, we want to have similar stuff in the same group. Yes. If you use other norms, you will have a different behavior. For example, you can use L1 norm. Sorry. Nobody screams when I make mistakes. So this is L2 norm, power 2. L1 norm, if it is power 1, is the simple difference. You can do L1, you can do L2, you can do cosine similarity. People try all different type of stuff. By default, most implementation have the Euclidean distance as default one of the parameters that you can play with. How can I measure? If you go high dimensional, and we have mentioned that, and we will mention it again, if you go super high dimensional, Euclidean distance sucks. It collapses. Then we have to play with other stuff and see whether maybe the cosine similarity give us something. But if you're super high dimensional, k-means may not be the best choice. <laughs> maybe we have to reduce the dimensionality with PCA before we give it to the poor, simple k-means algorithm. Yes? Sorry, again? Is this objective function convex? Like, does it converge to the same solution every time? Uh, no, it is not. So uh, one of the problem of k-means is that every time that you run it, you may get a slightly different result depending on many different factors, data, parameters, um, approximations. So, but, but it's, not, it's not huge. The, the, the variation in the result is not huge. 
and it depends on whether you have well-separated data or not. <clears throat> so here, so we minimize, minimize the sum, minimize the sum of squared errors to its prototype, prototype in each cluster, in each cluster. So why we call it error? Because the distance tell me in how far you are deviating from the cluster prototype, from the representative of the class, which is the average of the class. So ideally, everything should collapse on an average, but then the data is not useful. <laughs> if everybody, uh, uh, we need a little bit of diversity. So otherwise, we, we get only one SUV, manufacturer, one color, one truck, and one sport car. We don't want that. So we want a little bit of dispersion, but not much such that I can distinguish between SUV and sport car. May, they may get close, but not too close. Okay, <clears throat> so talking about the update, which is the core of k-means, it's unbelievable what you can do with a simple algorithm like this. So when we do the update, basically centroids are the average or the average of all x belonging to C sub k for k being 1, 2, 3, 4 up to capital K. How many classes you have? How many clusters you have? Whatever. 3, 4, 10, 20, whatever clusters you have. So you, you update like that. So the only question that remains is stopping. So you start with some initialization. You calculate the distances. You establish your objective function. You do the update. And OK, how long should I do this? Well, stopping is always a problem. That, the same question comes back and when you have a neural network. So when do you stop? How many iterations are enough? So you can stop first after some iterations. After some iterations. You can set it. You can say, yeah, I know what. You know, after 5,000 iterations, stop. Give me whatever you have. Second, we can stop when centers or centroids don't change anymore. Maybe not in a hard way or they don't change significantly. So if you visualize that I create a centroid here and then I, in every iteration I see is moving, 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 moving toward the actual center and then gets here and then is not moving. It's just a little bit jumping around but is not making any significant progress. So I stop. So centroids got home. They are not changing location anymore. Or third, which probably is, could be the same thing, when few or no data points change cluster. This is quite easy to observe because when you create your centroids randomly, and then you start updating them, you see that data points start changing cluster. The truck becomes a sport car. The SUV becomes a truck. Yes, you see how stupid that sounds? But we do those type of mistakes. So, and then after a while, you see that no car is changing cluster anymore. We converged. So you can, you can visualize the number of cases that a data point switched cluster. 
And you see this is large and then comes down and then gets to zero, ideally. Sometimes they still go back and forth for really tough cases. Then you have to say, okay, it's, going, it's, it's oscillating. If things are oscillating, stop. You are just wasting time. Just stop. It goes back and forth, back and forth. Because it's, the glass is half empty or half full. It's 50-50. Something is 50-50, the algorithm trying, okay, I give it to SUV, the sport car complains. I give it to sport car, the SUV complains. Okay, so go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Stop. When you oscillate, trust me, we oscillate a lot. And we will oscillate also when we get to neural networks. So you have to recognize it and you have to stop. So what are the problems of, what are the problems of k-means? You can find, you can find implementation of k-means everywhere. Python, MATLAB, Java, JavaScript, or whatever. So you can easily use it. <clears throat> so the big, the big problem is it needs k. Somebody has to tell k-means how many clusters to look for. Maybe I don't have that knowledge. Isn't that part of the supervision? It is. So, uh, so we are not that intelligent. No, we are not. So we can recognize the clusters nicely if you tell me how many are there. If you cannot tell me, then OK, we have to do some other stuff. Second, k-means is outlier sensitive. And outlier sensitive means, so you have, you have a cluster here, and you have a cluster here, and you have a data point here. <laughs> so that's an outlier. So that, that, that drives k-means crazy, the conventional, the traditional type of k-means. So if, if you know you have outliers, you got to be on watch for using k-means. And third, so k-means does hard clustering. Hard clustering means every data point that you uh, grab. So for example, if I, if I grab this data point, because let's say we, we are saying we have two clusters, which then the k-means have to assign this guy to one of them, which would be nonsensical. So let's get rid of this. So let's say we have class one and class two. So any data point that you grab is a vector that says 0 0.9 and 0 0.1, which means this data point belongs to the class one with a 90% probability and belongs to the class two with 0 0.1. That would be nice, but that's not what k-means does. It says 0, 1. So it's a hard clustering. So any of them that you grab, so that's the reason that we say, okay, so you grab this one is 0, 1. So this, any time that you have 0, 1, you have Boolean, you're basically losing information. So k-means as a hard clustering algorithm cannot, is not, is not in, in some situation does not follow the principle of graceful degradation. Which means that oscillation that I mentioned. So when, when you get to cases that is 50% here, 50% here, in literature we have something like that. So now I'm drawing chaotic things. So let just let me we come back maybe to this example. So let's say I have the so-called butterfly example. So this is a good example in literature that you have two classes. And for this guys and this guys, everything is clear, but this guy is exactly in the middle. So what do you do? Glass half empty or half full? Take a pick. Flip the coin. So if you, if you do 0, 1, that's difficult because it has to assign it to, so k-means here has to say that this guy is 0, 1. That's difficult. So you have to make a decision. That's why we, we got the Lukasiewicz logic that was, okay, sometimes you have to say, I don't know. So it's 0 0.5. So, but if I give it, so this is hard clustering. 
So if I do soft clustering, it will tell me 0 0.5, 0 0.5. It's 50-50. I don't know. It's an honest answer. K-means cannot do it. So but we will come and talk about some techniques that can do it. OK. Good. K-means, in spite of its performance on many different data sets, may appear too simple to qualify as an AI technique or machine learning technique, but it is. Nobody says you have to be complicated to qualify as a capable machine learning technique. So let's go back and think about the fact that clustering is unsupervised learning, unsupervised learning. And the emphasis is on these two letters, unsupervised. Yes? There are many, yes from data science field. When I say data science, that means conventional techniques that not necessarily have some sort of learning, explicit learning, but they have iterations. They are, what we don't here. So fundamentally, we don't talk about those class of classifications or, uh, or clustering techniques. So if, the, if this is about learning, okay, why not using some processing units, processing units, well, some people call them neurons, but we are not prepared yet to talk about neurons, so let's call them processing units, to place centroids on a map. On, a, on, an, on an adjustable map, adjustable map, which some people call self-organizing map. Self-organizing maps. So that, that's 1985, if you remember. That's more or less at the same time as backpropagation, independently of backpropagation. Is a neural network type. People didn't perceive it that way. They were, the terminology was a bit different. And nobody realized what we will talk about, that this is the case for, his, for this uh, approach. So what was the hypothesis? What was the idea here? What was the claim for self-organizing maps or SOM. One of the most neglected AI techniques right at the moment. So I don't know why people, maybe, maybe I don't know, don't, people don't understand it, but it's so simple, like, like k-means. <laughs> so the hypothesis is that the model or your solution self-organizes, self-organizes, based on learning rules, based on learning rules and interactions, and interactions. So the model, the hypothesis, the solution, the agent, the piece of software, the algorithm, whatever you want to call it. It organizes itself. Oh, this is a fancy word to use. Uh, I, I would say k-means organize itself too. I just give him some crappy centroids and it made really nice averages of them. That's self-organization. So, but okay, can we put it on a map? Why a map? Why? The human brain has a lot of map. Retinal maps, or sensoric map, this map. Um, motoric map, and so on. So it, it's a fancy word to use. If you can imitate some of the functionalities, you may have a case. So processing units, 
processing units, which we have no idea what that means. What, what do you mean? Well, the smallest piece of software that can process some numbers, which in human brain is the neuron. The processing units maintain, maintain proximity, proximity relationships, proximity relationships as they grow. Apparently they have to grow. Well, there are several things that are not clear at the moment, but maybe we learn. So first of all, the fancy word of self-organizing yourself. And then you use some rules and interactions. And then there are processing units. And they maintain proximity as they grow. OK. So that, that's a different terminology that K-means. But uh, you, you, need, you need a good terminology when you're starting to establish something new. If you want to establish something new, you have to have your own words. You cannot, you cannot use other people's words and provide a new algorithm. People call their algorithm algorithm, you call it a machine. Okay, support vector machines. As long as you can back it up, you're fine. So everybody will try it and say, these machines are fantastic. <laughs> so, but if you cannot back it up, people make, make fun of you. Machines, what do you mean? You have two vectors, what is the machine part? OK, so that was 1985, and this came through the so-called Cohonan map. So the Cohonan map, was quite simple. There were, there were some predecessors before Cohonan map, as there were predecessors before k-means. And this is the rule. There is nothing you can say that is new. Nothing. Nobody. Nobody has ever said anything new. Whatever you say has existed before. OK, what is the innovation part coming? Well, you have to find something, rethink it, and adjust it to today. That's the innovation part. Last century, we had two people who had new ideas, Norbert Wiener and Albert Einstein. Everybody else was just rethinking, pretty much. So, OK. If I put some processing units on a map, which some people may call a lattice, so let me put, I don't know, nine. And then I have some inputs. I just do one because otherwise it gets really messy. So I have one input, let's say. And this input is connected to all processing units. It's really messy. I, I, I don't think I can do it justice. but. That's the idea. So the input gets connected to all processing units or units. I'm hesitant to use the word neuron because we don't know what a neuron is yet. So let's just call them processing unit. And these connections all have some numbers that we call weights. And they can change. The weights can change. So, OK. Now this is a fancy way of just, OK, so what do you want to do with it? So this is, this is what we call a synaptic connection. Again, loosely inspired from the human brain or any other nervous system or any other animal. So we think we are so special, most likely we are not. There are other animals, they are smart, they have central nervous system, they learn. So, and then these units are an array of 
postsynaptic neurons. OK, so I, I'm using for the first time that word, neuron. So I just want to throw the terminology at you. So I have some circles, and I have a number, and the number is connected to the circles. Yes? So it goes, I, I, was, I was trying with my childish uh, drawing techniques to have a, that this is a map. And this goes from below, and you get connected to every neuron. So this is in the space. So this is like this, and they come like this. So I was trying to make, apparently I failed. So, OK. <clears throat> Good. The input. is connected, it's good that we do this exercise because this was, this was before we got back propagation as a research community. But nobody called this a neural network. So therefore, I'm hesitant to use the terminology of neural network. But it is. So the input is connected with each, with each unit which we can call neuron, of a map of a lattice, make it mathematical, which we can also call a map. So you have a lattice of processing units. They, when you say processing unit, that's a function. You give me a number, I put your number to my function, and I give you another number at the output. That's a processing unit, like a processor. But the processors crunch millions of numbers. A processing unit usually crunches a very small number of inputs, usually. <clears throat> OK. Before we do that, for the, for the concept of lattice, we have to also mention that on a lattice, you have the concept of neighborhoods. So the concept of neighborhood, neighborhood, so if I have a one-dimensional problem, so I have processing units And I'm looking at this processing unit. I may define a neighborhood that say, this guy's, this two are the neighbor of this guy. Why is that important? We, 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 I use the fancy word like postsynaptic neurons. Wow. Synaptic connections is just a number that we adjust. The number itself is not magic. The way that we adjust it and the things that we do it is magic. So why is that important? Because we assume also in the human brain, the circuits that are responsible for doing one thing, they grow together, and they sh don't show discontinuity. You don't see, if you visualize the synaptic strengths of neurons, you don't see a neuron like this. And then a neuron like this right beside it. Not going to happen. Because things grow together. There is a smoothness in the learning. So if you define a neighborhood, you are bringing in the concept that they have to grow together. So you cannot have a neuron here is the best, and the neurons beside it suck. Not going to work. You have discontinuity in your learning procedure. You will not be able, it's like jumping from the, uh, from the tenth stairs to the first stair. You cannot do that. You, you will break your bones. You have to go step by step smoothly to get down. So that's why we're talking about the concept of neighborhood. And of course, if we do that in a, in a lattice, so now I'm drawing a an arbitrary lattice. <laughs> I 
and I connect them because that's a lattice. I may have some cross section in some cases, but not here. So, and let's say this is my this is my neuron in focus, and I can now I have a two D, and I can say you know what. This is my neighborhood. I can define the neighborhood. So if I don't define the neighborhood, I cannot grow with each other. OK. So possible, possible neighborhoods so this is, this is 1D. This is 2D. Go 3D to go whatever pi dimension you like. OK. So what is the goal? So the goal? is find, find weights, find weight values uh, such that adjacent units have similar values, have similar values. Again, so we want to have a smooth transition. If this is this neuron and the weight comes down and then it comes down and then it comes down from the other side, same thing, same thing, same thing. So if a neuron has a high synaptic value, the other ones have lower, lower, lower. So I don't get I don't get something like this. So that cannot happen in learning. You will just kill the iterations. You need smooth transition. So units, neurons have to grow together. There are, we can mathematically formulate that. You need piecewise continuity. If your error function is not piecewise continuous, you will just find in a black hole, and then you cannot recover. So also, uh, inputs are assigned to units that are similar, that are similar similar to them. What? What, what, again? So an input comes, and I want to find a neuron that has its weights have the same value as this input. So you want to copy it? Yeah, but I'm not copying one. I want to copy as many inputs as possible. I want, as a processing unit, I will be competing with other processing units with everybody else, maybe I'm a little bit gracious in my own neighborhood. So if I win in lottery, I may go in my neighbor and say, okay, guys, come on, be around me, I won. But I will not go to the, the other street. I don't, other street, I don't know the people. Why should I share my winning with them? So what that means, this inputs that come in, if this is the neuron or this is the neuron that is best representing this input, that means the weights that goes to this neuron are really similar to the weights of this specific input. You are trying to become similar like your input. What? You are, you are becoming your data. Well, that's exactly what recognition of structure in the data means. So if you can become similar to the data, you will recognize the boundaries. And each unit, each unit becomes 
the center of a cluster. What? So if I have this, so if this is, if you tell me you need two clusters, this may be one cluster, and let's say this one be one cluster. So this would be a big neuron with high values, and this will be another big neuron with high values. So just imagine a, a three-dimensional Gaussian centered on these neurons. So high values and then goes down. So that means there are many, many inputs that this neuron is representing. And there are many, many inputs that this input is presenting if I have only two clusters. But wait a minute. Isn't that what k-means did? Yes. What's your point? Well, we created centuries and we let them go in k-means. Now you are just nailing them down. Yes. What's your point? Isn't that the same thing? Yes, it is. So you are coming from that door, I'm coming from this door, maybe we identify different structures. <laughs> so k-means is basically constrained SOM. We didn't know that until, I don't know, just recently. Some, some people sat down and mathematically showed, oh, <laughs> actually, this is the same thing as gay means. <laughs> so it's constraint. These are the same averages that we talked about. These are the centroids that we talked about. But if you tell me two, I will find two. So you need m a bigger lattice to represent. If you, if you are looking for two clusters, you cannot have just two neurons here. You need maybe 10. If you are looking for 10 clusters, you may be needing 100 neurons. So the size of the map becomes an issue. But fundamentally, k-means is when you nail down your averages, and then you get SOM. But SOM is much cooler than k-means. You can visualize it. It's, it's fantastic. So it's Thursday, Shivam will show some, some stuff with, with, uh, with SOM. It can means nothing, yeah? Why? You can see the averages wander around and then they go home. Oh, okay. It's the same thing. But when you do it with SOM, it becomes cool. It's one of those things. But we have to know this is the same stuff. This is the same thing. It doesn't look that way, but it is. Okay. So, given, now I want to formulate that. Given, given input x, given input x, find x could be a vector, could be a matrix. I don't want to go in detail, depending on what the data is. Find, find the ith neuron or unit with closest closest weight with closest weight vector by competition so that's that's what s1 tries to do given any input vector x, find the neuron or the unit that is closest to that. So calculate the distance. Again, you have to calculate distance, I guess. <laughs> calculate the distance and say, this neuron has some weights that are very similar to my feature values. So I will assign this input to that neuron. So we have fixed the centroids, and the data is moving. So that's what I said. You come from that door, I come from this door. <laughs> but we are attacking the same problem, so chances are in the middle of the room, we say, hi, hi, hi. Why are you here? Whoa, oh, I was born 1975. What are you doing here? So that means 
wi transport x will be maximum, if that's the case. Because when we say, when we say that my input x will be similar to the neuron, that means with the weights of the neuron, then the dot product has to become maximum because it's the same vector. If ideally, it, it will not become the same vector, but it will become very similar. So if it is very similar, that means I have two vectors like this. So it's not a vector like this, that the dot product disappears. So if the more you go this, the cosine similarity increases, so w times x increases. So I have to maximize that. We minimize the distances. Here we maximize the weights times x. Same problem. Look, I don't care about the details of k-means and SOM. Do we get this, how we attack us the same problem with different ideas? Same concept, but look at it differently. Same tools, distance measurement, but we apply it here or here or here. That's the, that's the design process that we should learn. The details of this, I go to Wikipedia, look it up. And maybe Wikipedia does a better job than I do. Yes. Sorry again? If, if we are going to decide where the data is going to go, it depends. No, we don't design it. But when we say this, that basically we are pushing the weights toward the data. Okay. So the but the centers are sort of fixed okay. in contrast to k-mean. Therefore, we call it constraint uh, as, again, nobody, nobody. So k-means, what is wrong with this? <laughs> so SOM is constrained k-means. Nobody screams. You have to learn to scream. Maybe we should, I don't know, I hate rewards, but, but whenever I make a mistake and somebody screams, you have a reward of some sort. I don't know. So SOM is the constraint. If you take the k-means and constrain it, you get SOM. Good that I catch that. Thank you for the question. So we are pushing, we are fixing the centers, which are the post-synaptic neurons. And then we push the weights toward the data. So we are not pushing the averages, basically. Yes? No, no. So you, you take the, that means k-means is more generic, actually. If you put some conditions on k-means, you get SOM, which is fixed the position of the centroids. OK. <clears throat> for, each, for each unit j in the neighborhood n of i, i is a, is a neuron, right? I just number them. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on. So I'm looking at neuron number i, and then that has a neighborhood that we talked about, some sort of neighborhood. And then now I'm looking at other ones around it. So for each unit j in the neighborhood n of i of the winning neuron i, so there's, there's one neuron that wins. That, that winning neuron becomes the centroid of the class. But then in the proximity, there will be other uni units and neurons that are sort of the class centroids, but not exactly. So but they are close. We update the weights. We update the weights of J, which is WJ. So now I'm looking at the winning neuron. 
is this is my winning neuron or this is my winning neuron, then I have a neighborhood of some sort. And if this is I, this may be J, then I want to adjust the weights because that's the learning. Learning is adjusting the weights. Learning to play with the synapses. So we, we come back to it. So this is the first time you are mentioning them. So weights outside of n of i are not updated. Well, that's a difference to k-means. In k-means, in every iteration, we updated everything. Here, I only make update inside the neighborhood. And you can have easily a map of 100 by 100, 10,000 neurons. But you are looking for five clusters. So I have 10,000 units, 10,000 potential centroids, but I'm looking just for five. Why? Because I have smooth proximity close to them. Why is that important? Why? Well, because k-means was hard clustering. SOM is soft clustering. So you have a transition from being something to not being something. So, OK. So SOM has three stages, basically. One, competition. Such an ugly word, but here makes sense. So at the beginning, every neuron will compete with every other neuron to represent the input. I want to represent the input. No, I want to represent the input. So that's a competition. Whoever is closer will win. So what if you chose the wrong neuron to represent? We have adjustment. We will learn. We will learn that we made a mistake, hopefully. Second. Yeah, we know, we know, competition is really ugly. Let's collaborate also a little bit. So collaboration. Where is the collaboration? Well, the concept of neighborhood. If I win in lottery, I share with my neighbors. Yeah, I, I competed to win, but now that I'm winning, I'm not a jerk. I will, I will share some of it. So that interplay between competition and collaboration is the fingerprint of self-organizing maps. That has been reused in other ways, adversarial learning, generative models, and other stuff, the, main, the underlying concept. And of course, last, you have to adjust the weights. So weight update. You have to update the weights. You compete. You collaborate, you adjust the weights. You compete, you collaborate, you adjust the weights. I doubt it that our brain works that way at the synaptic level. But nobody knows how it works, so okay. That's a, that's a guess. That's a model. Yes. Sorry again. Are we ending up with units that are not part of the neighborhood? Like are not part of any neighborhood Usually we have way more units that we have clusters. So many, many units may have really little small weights. So and if I visualize them with way big weights having big amplitudes, they may have no contribution. <laughs> yeah, that happens because we want to we want to figure out the boundary between the groups. So we need we need the uh, excess of of, uh, of neurons. OK, how does the competition work? <clears throat> so in the competition, we have to find the most similar unit. So that means i of x is argmax over j. And x with respect to the distance between x and the weights. So look at your inputs. Look at the distance. 
between the inputs and the weights for the ith neuron and see whether you can find the maximum. I want to be as similar as possible. If I go down, I, I, the Euclidean distance, if you have a matrix, people implement it as dot operation is fast, and then we know again. So if things are similar, their dot product will be high. If they are orthogonal, which are very different, then it, we don't want that. We want similar stuff. Yes? Uh, at the beginning, probably, uh, but the concept, depending on how you define the neighborhood, we will prevent that, actually, because we don't want too much overlap. Some overlap, but not, not much, because we want the distinction. So, and this J will go from 1 to up to M, and M being the number of units. So, which is the size of your map? How many neurons do you have? It's one of my... Usually, it's one of my biggest headaches when we experiment with self-organizing map, and you, you say, OK, I have 120 classes or clusters. OK, but how big should the map be? I don't know. Start with 1,000 by 1,000, so you have a million neurons. A million neurons for 120 clusters? I have no clue. Start and see what happens. Then we have collaboration. So the winning is you want to be as similar as possible to input. At the very beginning, your weights are random. But then we start updating. Hopefully, at some point, we come up with some smart weight update. Competition, collaboration through neighborhoods, and then update. So use the lateral distance, d sub ij between, between the winner unit i and the neighbor unit j. So we have a, we have a function which is looking at the distance of dij. And that distance, you can calculate it again with Euclidean distance, is some sort of Gaussian function minus the distance dij squared over 2 times sigma squared. So which means, if, if, I, if I choose something like this, I'm choosing a Gaussian neighborhood, which is, which is a wise thing to do because, again, we need, a, we need a smooth transition from perfect weight, a little bit perfect, not so much perfect. It's still acceptable. Okay, you are out of the neighborhood. So you have the distance, dij, and you are working with the zero mean. And you have a Gaussian like this at 1. This is my hij of dij. And this is my 2 times the standard deviation. So this is the width. So now here, with setting the Gaussian, of course we use Gaussian. We, we know all its characteristics. It's nice. We can design it. We can center it anywhere we want. So with that sigma, with that standard deviation, you define how generous you are. How big is the neighborhood? So do you want to collaborate a lot? Do you want to collaborate more or you want to compete more? So this is a Gaussian neighborhood. Is that the only possibility? No. Pretty much everything I say here, I'm just giving you the standard configuration, and you can play with everything. So you can play with the size, with, with the function, with the configuration. So what is sigma here, for example? That's a parameter that you have to set. How, how do I do that? Well, usually 
sigma is a function of number of iterations and you start with a sigma O initial value and then we put that through an exponential decay function of minus n over t. n is the number of iterations. So number of iterations and t is a constant. So at the beginning, the job is tough. I need the help of my neighbors. I share. Toward the end, uh, to help with my neighbors, I want to win. So maybe at the beginning, I start with a Gaussian like this, and then shrink it, shrink it, shrink it over time. So at the end, I will not share credit with anybody. Because toward the end, we are getting the cluster centers. I want to be the winner. So the collaboration at the beginning is a lot, but it decreases over time. So any type of exponential decay, collaboration is high, comes down rapidly as a function of number of iterations. At the beginning, a lot. Over time, not much more. So more collaboration at the beginning. You are already 654. How that? OK. I was slow today, wasn't I? We, we have to, we needed five more minutes to finish it, but we will do it on, on Thursday. And then we wrap it up, and then we move into classification. So on Thursday, we have also the uh, tutorial on self-organizing maps.